Our first lesson for today comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 20, and these words will serve as a basis of this morning's sermon. Meanwhile, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the word of our Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia portion of God's Word that we're going to celebrate and meditate on this morning it was the first reading from Acts chapter 9. But as we begin, let us pray. Dear Lord, it is your Word, your baptism, your means of grace which change our hearts. So do that now, as we have gathered around your Word and sacrament, that our hearts would continue to be changed, that they would be covered in your protection, washed away from sin changed over to being a part of your family. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, so have you ever heard the term frenemy? Surprisingly, I thought that was actually more of a new word, a new slang that we've created, but frenemy actually goes back all the way to the 1950s. And you can kind of tell it's two words pushed together, friend and enemy, so, a frenemy is somebody who you spend a lot of time with, who you really enjoy, you get along with well, but at the same time, they're pretty much opposed to you in everything you do. They're the ones that you go out to, you go out to supper with, you have a good time, you chat with them, but then the next day, maybe they're a co-worker and they oppose everything you try to do. They do it with a smile on their face. Because they still get along with you. They're still friendly with you. But at the same time, they're your enemy. So we think about a friend of me, I want you to think about the position that this disciple named Ananias finds himself in during our, our, our Bible lesson. Ananias has heard about this Saul, this man of Tarsus. Saul got his first taste of blood actually early in the days after Jesus ascended into heaven and they had extra people joining the apostles who were proclaiming Christ, one of them was by the name of Stephen. Stephen, for telling people who Jesus was, for not backing down from the truth, but in fact telling the Jews, yep, you were the ones who sent him to the cross. You crucified him. They stoned him. They killed him. 
It was Saul of Tarsus who stood there, nodding in approval, accepting the cloaks of the people who were hurling the stones. Since that time, Paul, Saul, has only grown bolder. Now, his threats against these followers of the way, the ones who believe in the resurrected Christ, they come as naturally to him as breath. He breathes out murderous threats. And so he puts his plans into action. He goes to the high priest and he seeks documentation, letters from the high priest which would give him authorization that in Damascus he could go to the synagogue, arrest these followers of the way, and then bring them back to Jerusalem where certainly, certainly they will be put to death. Saul wants to destroy these people who follow this Jesus. And Ananias knows why Saul is there, what he has come to do, knowing that he has that documentation probably with him, probably on his person, that is meant to destroy the, the faith and the people who belong to the faith he belongs to. So when Ananias receives a vision from the Lord and says to him, hey, I want you to go to Saul. Yep, the one from Tarsus. In fact, I'll give you the directions, right, to go down Straight Street, go right to this house. You'll find him there. You're going to go to him because you're going to heal him. Wait a minute, Lord. Think of how many ways this can go bad. Think of what might happen if I put myself in this place, in this position. If I go there, Lord, what, what has changed? I know he's been breathing out murderous threats against me and the people who belong to my faith. Do I think it's changed at all? I mean, you said he can't see, he's lost his sight, he's blind, but he has his compatriots with him. They're just as likely to arrest me and drag me in chains back to Jerusalem and kill me. Besides, if he's blind, isn't this good for us? Don't we want our enemies vanquished? And I mean, he is very clearly one of our enemies. I mean, even, wouldn't put it past him, he's a very educated man, he's a very smart man. What if he actually pretends to be friendly with me just so that he can join up with me and the other followers of the way, the other believers here, and then pulls out his papers, arrests us all, and drags us to our death. Lord, I don't know that I should do this. He's our enemy. Would we have said anything different? It's a pretty big risk when you think about this guy you know has come to destroy you and yet you're supposed to show compassion on him. That just as Ananias learned from Jesus, from his disciples, just as we have learned to love other people in the way that Christ has loved us. That means even loving our enemies. The people who oppose us, the people who hate us, yes, even the people who want to kill us. But to put ourselves in front of them, put ourselves directly into harm's way, I don't know, God. That seems like an awful big risk. You think about this idea of enemies, I've mentioned frenemies, and you think about that, maybe there's people even at church, maybe you consider them frenemies. People that you're nice to, you smile to, but at the same time, you just feel like they're your nemesis. They are the one who is opposed to you, the one who continues to oppose you, kind of your antithesis, but you know you're supposed to be nice to them, because that's the Christian thing to do. But in this thought, when we think about treating people as frenemies, do we then just kind of always keep that, that barrier and that distance away from other people? That, yep, I'll say hi to you, yep, I'll shake your hand, I'll smile at you, but you have a barrier. There's only so far I'm letting you get to me because I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be burned. I don't want you to do what you've done to me in the past, and that has hurt me. And so I'll be nice. 
But let's admit we're not friends. Let's just keep a distance. Now you think about Saul of Tarsus and you think about what Jesus said to him in that vision. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I don't know that any of us can claim, maybe you can, maybe you claim that I've breathed out murderous threats against God's people. But Jesus wouldn't say to me, because I haven't done that, Jesus wouldn't say to me, why are you persecuting me? But then step back for a moment and ask yourself, have I ever done anything to hurt the church? Not the building. The church is the people. Have I done things to hurt the body of believers? When I do, keep people at an arm's length because I don't want to get hurt? Do I create more separation between me and these people that I call my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do I decide that when I hear about somebody else going through something, I'm like, you know what, that's their problem, it's not mine, and I just kind of keep going on my way? Do I hurt the church? To love is a risk. I don't know if we always know this. A lot of times when we get into loving relationships, we kind of do it because we feel a little bit of safety. Like this person won't probably try to hurt me, and so I will choose to love them. I will choose to be compassionate upon them, giving upon them, because that is what I'm choosing to do. But anytime you do that, in any relationship in which you choose to love, you always risk being hurt. Always. Because every single one of us at some time, whether it inadvertently, ignorantly, or willfully, we hurt other people. We fail to keep promises. We don't act the way that Christ has loved us. We do hurt the church. We hurt the body of believers around us. In that way, are we really all that different from Saul? But Saul's different, right? He had a vision. I mean, he, he had Jesus come to him and, and, and ream him out, really. Saul's different. But just seeing Jesus doesn't change people. Just having a vision doesn't change people. There were plenty of people who saw the risen Lord, who saw him, who saw him before his death, and absolutely refused to believe him. They were the very same ones who put him on the cross, who crucified him. And they thought they were doing God a favor. It's not the vision that changed Saul. It was what came next. It was the word, it was the message. But as you can imagine, Ananias has all of these doubts, has all of these, these, these misgivings, these ponderings. Should I actually go and do this? Because I can be hurt if I go and show compassion to Saul. But he trusts the Lord. He trusts the Lord, and so he goes. He goes down Straight Street. He goes to that house. He finds the one from Tarsus, the one named Saul. And he puts his hands on him. And you realize how he addresses Saul. He doesn't address him as the persecutor, as the hater, as the enemy. He says, Brother Saul, you're my family. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see he was immediately baptized. And he ate, he drank, he regained his strength. And then you hear what comes next. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus told Ananias, yep, this is my chosen instrument. He's the one who's going to go forward before the Gentiles, before the non-Jews, before their kings, and yep, even before my people, the same ones who persecuted me, the same ones who crucified me. But he is my chosen instrument. 
I'm changing him. He's no longer an enemy. Now he's family. He's your brother. You belong together. Followers of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus himself. Jesus used Ananias to bring Saul, the great persecutor of the church, to bring that man into the church family. To wash him with water so that he had all of his sins, all, all, all of his sins, all of the things he had done, all of the arrests he had made and, and the, the judgments he had, he had ruled over to send Christians to their death, that's all washed away. Instead, he's clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The one who tried to kill the church is now the one who preaches for the church. The one who immediately gets out there in the synagogue and says, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, he is our perfect Savior. Yes, he is the one who kept God's law and then paid the sacrifice on the cross so that we would be forgiven no matter what we've done, no matter how we've hurt the church. That Christ has forgiven us. See, it wasn't the vision that changed Saul. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who worked through simple water, through simple words, and changed his heart completely, turned him from enemy to family. And although we may not have breathed out murderous threats against Christianity, although we have not had a vision of Jesus coming to us and saying, why do you persecute me? We all have had the same journey of Saul. All of us, when we come into this world, we're born in sin. We are born, in fact, even worse than that, we're born hostile to God. The sinful mind is hostile to God's law. It cannot submit to it, nor can it do so. And he took every single one of us. For those of us who have been baptized, the same Holy Spirit. Different water, different area, different time, but the same Holy Spirit who changes hearts, changed ours. And we were washed clean of our sins, not just for the ones we had done up to that point, but all of them. That God put his name on us, adopted us into his family, clothing us with Christ's perfection. So he sees us as we are, we are family, no longer enemies. God has changed us from enemy to family. He took that risk. He knew we could reject him. God knew Saul could reject him. Even with, the, even with the vision, even with Ananias, Saul could have rejected. Saul could have arrested Ananias. Saul could have continued in his task, but he didn't. Because God changed him. It's the same way God has changed us. God took that risk to give us everything. To give us the forgiveness of sins, to give us perfection, to give us life eternal with him, all at his cost, not ours. He loved us, took that risk to love us in that way, even if we reject it. So the question now we ask ourselves, since I've been forgiven of the ways that I've hurt the church, how then can I build up the church? How then... Can I draw other people to the risen Savior? How can I show them what Christ has done for me and for everyone? Can I go out on that limb? Just like Ananias. To go, yes, even to our enemies, not just even frenemies, but enemies. And share with them the risen Christ. A God who has done everything. And washed us clean in his blood. So that we are saved. We go out knowing that God has changed us from enemy to family. As we proclaim him and what he's done to others, and as we proclaim it among each other, encouraging each other, the family of God is built up. More change from being enemy to family. All because of the power of the risen Lord. It's in his name that we go. Alleluia. Amen.